Yeah, um, uh, this is part of a series that I called uh, systems composting or composting the systems. And I there's a few people that I have the sense are either by their thinking or their actions or everything together are bringing a way of looking at the systems and transforming the systems that I find really inspiring and powerful. And Vijay Kumar is one of them. Um, so I'm really delighted that uh, you could make it today uh, to be here with us. Um, and the way I got to know uh, about Vijay Kumar is was through Didi Per's house, who's also here, and Walter Yene, who's uh, not here, but uh, both of them uh, have been quite an inspiration for me uh, with their work about soil and how regenerating soil can actually make a whole difference for our health and, and, and the, the health of the planet in general, not only climate, but everything. So in, in watching some of the YouTube videos, I, I ran across a, a workshop uh, that uh, Vijay Kumar offered and I was just, blown away by the beauty of the of the project and and what felt like something very natural about it so i was like, this this feels like the future i i want to have so there was that my heart was like oh my god i i just really really find this very good so there was this kind of even somatic recognition of something really important and then i was very Lucky, lucky to have a conversation with you uh, some time ago, and also then teasing out the, the the many layers of how the systems are inter interconnected. So I, I I will warn everyone that although I I'm sh I'm sure uh, Vijay Kumar is going to talk about the the natural farming side. I am quite interested in the social and the political aspect of this project. Um, which I think also goes to show how important those land uh, nodal interventions, um, they spread, the effect spreads everywhere. So without further ado from me, I would love for you, if it, Vijay, if you can introduce yourself, just saying whatever you think it's important for people to know about you, um, what brought you here. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, Rita. It's quite clear that you brought me here. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. And uh, I'm so happy that uh, Didi is here. And uh, really, it was so uh, wonderful to have had Didi and Walter visitors in November 2019. We learned so much. And we are still in touch. And there are many seminars that uh, Walter and I do together. But it's a, a you know, relationship which has really helped us in so many ways. Uh, I am leading the program on natural farming in uh, Andhra Pradesh, which is a state of uh, 50 million people south of India. We have a very large coastline, almost 1000 kilometers coastline. So we have both the pluses of a coastline, but also the cyclones, which are quite uh, frequent. We also have a very large portion, which is a semi-arid area. So with very little rainfall. So there again, the uh, prevalence of droughts. Uh, so in this particular context, uh, the, what we are trying to do is to transform all the farmers in the state towards natural farming. Uh, I'm heading this program. I'm with the government of Andhra Pradesh. Uh, even though I retired four years ago, the state government has, uh, you know, given me a, a contract to head this program and take this to a logical conclusion. So what I will do is I'll make a brief presentation and then, but wait, you know, I think a lot more will come in discussions. So I may rush through the presentation, but I am hoping that we'll we'll get a lot of insights both about the program and again from the questions that you pose it'll also 
perhaps uh, give me some new insights into how I look at the program. So that is the advantage of this session. Yeah, so as I said, this is the uh, program of transformation, transform transforming a state. We have around 6 million uh, farmers and farm workers, and we have a total population of 50 million people. So the ambition, the vision, the dream, is to transform all of them and thereby ensure that all the citizens get uh, uh, healthy, nutritious food and also we, we protect the planet. Uh, now, of course, all of you know that we, have, we are facing multiple emergencies. Farmers' livelihoods are under stress. At the same time, the food that we are eating is not healthy. And then we have a a huge environment crisis, degradation of soil, water emergency, global warming, decreased biodiversity. And we also know that the food system itself is responsible for many of these problems. So we have a situation where food system is both the victim and also a cause of the problem. So our challenge is, can, this, can it also be the solution? So can farmers, through farming in harmony with nature, provide a solution? And we believe very strongly that yes, it is eminently possible. Uh, not only really possible, it has to be done. So, so the natural farming, we call it the Andhra Pradesh community managed natural farming. It is, you know, ag regenerative agriculture, agroecology, I think all of you are familiar with these, uh, with the philosophy and also the practices. Uh, in the Indian context, I mean, these are the universal principles of natural farming that uh, we are following. We have made some, uh, you know, based on our better understanding, uh, we are, uh, you know, prioritizing that how do you keep the soil covered with crops? 365 days of the year. So how do you ensure that there's a living root? Then uh, crop diversity, anywhere from 10 to 20 crops. Also, wherever possible, incorporate trees. Minimize the disturbance of the soil. Integrate animals into farming. Then use of biostimulants as necessary catalysts. I'll explain this because this is a very special feature of the uh, Andhra Pradesh natural farming and also Indian uh, natural farming, then uh, keep the cover, keep a cover on the soil. Organic residues could be essentially crop residues. Then use of indigenous seed and then uh, pest management through botanical extracts. And uh, there's only one red box here. No synthetic fertilizers, pesticides, herbicides and weedicides. So I believe that these eight principles, I mean nine principles, they are common across the world. But the way in which they are applied are uh, you know, unique to the context. They'll be different in India, they'll be different in UK, USA, Africa. But the principles are, uh, I, I believe, are universal. Uh, so what is distinct about uh, India is the role of the biostimulants. Uh, I'll explain that a little later. And uh, what we have also, uh, we have got a very major breakthrough and that is thanks to insights from Walter, uh, where we have what is called as a pre-monsoon dry sowing phenomenon. And that actually enables us to uh, keep, the, keep a living root in the soil for 365 days, even in the landscapes where there is no assured irrigation. And uh, this I, I, I mean, anybody following Walter, you'd be familiar with this. The entire thing is the, the root exudates. The, so therefore, we are seeing that plants, the soil microbes, and the minerals in the soil, and of course, photosynthesis, air, water. So they all have a very symbiotic relationship. And uh, it is the root exudates which are actually feeding the diverse uh, 
soil microbiome and in turn the microbiota are exchanging essential minerals and nutrients with the plants so the microbiota are benefiting from the root exudates and from the roots themselves and in turn they are benefiting the plants so this method of agriculture is also leading to soil carbon sequestration enhanced water holding capacity additional 1 gram of carbon leads to 8 grams of water holding better nutrient absorption mechanism and then soil structure so our soils are all compact soils so better soil microbiology and not disturbing the soils <clears throat> enables uh, very healthy soil structure uh, micro aggregates macro aggregates resulting in a porous soil so this is uh, basically what we are intending to do through our uh, practices and you can see here uh, we practice uh, this 365 days green cover with crop diversity it's not as if every farmer is doing it but this is the you know uh, this is our model this is how we are trying to take it to you know farmers across our landscapes and uh, you can see here this is a uh, seed inoculum so this is called bija amruta bij means seed and amruta is nectar so it consists of cow dung cow urine lime bit of soil so it's fermented for about 12 hours and then this liquid is uh, you know sprinkled on the seed and if it is a question of seedling the seedlings are dipped in this uh, this is a uh, the a soil inoculum this is called ganajivamrut so again you have cow dung jaggery or molasses lentil flour cow urine and handful of uncontaminated soil it is uh, mixed and uh, you know put in the form of uh, lumps which are fermented for 5 days and it can be used for 6 months so generally the farmers use it before the sowing uh, so this is a basal application uh, before sowing and what walter helped us to understand was that instead of broadcasting it in the field we should use it uh, along with the seed so we have changed our uh, methods in this then this is a liquid inoculum similar ingredients as the previous one so this is applied once a week or once in 10 days once in 15 days depending on the crop so there are different uh, protocols depending on the crop and uh, this is used both as a soil uh, uh, you know for the soil so here you can see it's mixed with the irrigation water the ratio of 1 is to 10 and it's also used as a foliar spray so you alternate a foliar spray with uh, application to the root zone uh, so this is again throughout the crop cycle uh, there is a frequency prescribed frequency for application of this uh, liquid biostimulant we also have plenty of uh, botanical formulations for pest management these are again they include neem they include custard apple they include a lot of plants almost 200 different uh, formulations are there so depending on the intensity of the pests and depending on the type of the pests uh, there is a recommendation as to which uh, botanical formulation should be used but uh, we see this uh, uh, botanical pesticide application as a temporary phenomenon because we are finding that once the soil biology is restored many farmers are now saying that they they don't they don't have to use the uh, botanical even the botanical pest formulations so it's an interim phase then uh, use of indigenous seeds uh, because this is uh, we believe is a very important uh, part of uh, natural farming and uh, we have now collected more than 800 different varieties of rice millets vegetables pulses but still you know given the requirement we are still at a beginning stage 
uh, we want to expand this, take this to scale. Uh, yeah, more than 400, sorry, for the 400 traditional varieties have been conserved, almost 200 rice varieties themselves. And uh, this is the size of the, the scaling of the program. We started this program in the year 2016 with 40,000 farmers and seven, in 700 villages. Last year, we had touched about 700,000 uh, farmers in 3,000 villages. Uh, this includes both farmers and farm workers. And uh, this year, we, we had actually targeted reaching 1 billion farmers and farm workers. Uh, but the COVID actually has uh, really uh, constrained our work. So we are still taking stock of what we have achieved. So by end of May, we'll know what we have done for the 2021 season. And then we want to plan for 21-22 season. We are funded by the government. So the government has committed around $280 million for this program till 2024-25 which also includes a loan of 90 million euros from KFW Bank. And we're also funded by a philanthropy around $16 million uh, till 2022-23. So essentially funding from government, uh, almost 90%, 92% is funding from government. And in terms of impacts, you know, we have seen uh, uh, we have taken nine crops, which account for 78% of the uh, farmed area. Rice is the most important crop for us. Then uh, groundnut and cotton are the, uh, the next two important crops. But these nine crops collectively account for almost 78% of the area. And we've been doing independent uh, you know, crop cutting experiments to look at the yields, costs, and incomes. And we find that you know, there is not really any great yield penalty because that is the fear of many farmers that you know, the yields are going to decline. It takes a long time for the yields to sort of climb up. But we are seeing that once the protocols of natural farming are applied, farmers are not experiencing any yield penalty. On the other hand, what they are seeing is yields uh, are better than conventional in many cases. In some cases, of course, conventional variety is better. But what is important is the cost reduction is very significant. And for the main crop, as you can see here, almost 20% uh, cost reduction. Then there are some crop where the cost reduction is 36%. And in the case of chilies is uh, 26%. And as a result, the net income of farmers who are undergoing this transformation uh, has increased very significantly across all the crops. Of course, some crops it's uh, you know very high increase, but in any case, every every crop they they have increased their net incomes, uh, except in this case, in this particular year, in the case of maize, they incurred a small decline. Uh, there's one more thing here in, in our farmers transformation, we do not give any incentive to farmers in terms of monetary incentive. It's a leap of faith. Those who believe in this make the transformation. Uh, but then the fact that, you know, numbers have increased so dramatically from 40,000 to 700,000 in a, such a short period of time uh, shows that, uh, you know, farmers don't require any at least in the case of India, you know, small, because we have small and marginal farmers, uh, our typical holding is uh, one hectare. Uh, in addition to better uh, net incomes, we also see biodiversity coming back. Uh, of course, these are, you know, we, we are flooded with this when we go to the field, we see such beautiful uh, beautiful changes in the landscape wherever natural farming has been taken up. Uh, this is something which is very important. We also recognize the most vulnerable people are those who are landless. So the intervention for them is in the form of uh, homestead gardens. And last year, we were, this year, we have covered almost 300,000 farmers 
uh, farm families who are landless poor and uh, this was actually a great blessing for them in the corona times because they could get healthy vegetables in their backyard and this year we are actually last year we decided that we should take it to everyone so every everybody in the almost uh, all the our target is to cover 1 million farmers and farm workers with kitchen gardens uh, of course we are seeing that they are able to take some 15 to 20 different kinds of uh, vegetables uh, we have some models now so that they can take this crops throughout the year and in fact just before this meeting i was reviewing that with one of the districts and now uh, the most important thing is how does it get scaled up and we know we have so many obstacles you know worldwide it's been very difficult to scale up agroecology uh, but in the case of andhra pradesh uh, we have had uh, government support uh, so i was a very senior uh, civil servant I, i mean so the government trusted me and uh, to make this change possible even though we had a change of government uh, two years ago the new government also decided that this is the best in the best interest of farmers so therefore a political support to both at the you know uh, level of the chief minister and also the bureaucracy they they support this uh, you know state wide roll out then uh, this is knowledge intensive agriculture this is not input intensive agriculture so through a lot of investment in uh, you know uh, in people's uh, capacities it requires that kind of uh, investment in people's capacities so our strength has been preparing this uh, package of practices materials in the form of videos etc but the two three major pillars are the women self help groups and federations and a farmer to farmer extension system and the role of facilitating organizations apart from that we have collaborations with uh, global uh, and national scientific institutions and experts and also convergence with all departments of the government i just want to spend one two minutes on the role of women and uh, uh, farmer to farmer extension system uh, this is something very important the the social capital that we have built in andhra pradesh this started 20 years ago in fact i was heading the program for 10 years from 2000 to 2010 and we organized uh, in a combined state at that time andhra pradesh and telangana were one state so by 2010 we had organized around 11.5 million women in rural areas into in self help groups and uh, into that program we had also introduced sustainable agriculture initiatives way back in 2005 so in 2016 when i started this program we were able to once again go back to the women and ask them to participate actively in this program and uh, in the next step i mean the, currently what we are looking at is how do women take greater ownership women's collectives take greater ownership of the program and uh, typically a women self help group is a 10 member group and then they are federated at the village level 10 almost 10 to 20 such groups are federated at the village level and then about 30 to 40 such federations are federated again at a at a mandal level sub district level and we also have district federations so in andhra pradesh currently there are uh, 8.3 million women in rural areas who are organized in these collectives so in our project area we have almost 140000 women self help groups so as you can see here so women are involved in planning women are involved in preparing these bio inputs uh, knowledge sharing helping each other so this is really the magic behind the program is the investment in the social capital uh, of uh, women and once we reach out to women the whole family then gets involved uh, so we also have a health intervention where we educate them around health and uh, nutrition interventions 
Then the other uh, key pillar is that knowledge dissemination happens through a, another farmer. It's a farmer to farmer extension system. And you can see here uh, this uh, lady, her name is is one of our uh, champion farmers who, who you know, is training other farmers. And in that village, she actually took a plot of land so that she can show others that natural farming practices are more profitable, less costly, better yields. So rather than preaching, it is through practice they're able to influence other farmers. So this is a very important, uh, uh, you know, lever uh, for the program. We have close to 6,000 such champion farmers. We require one per 100 farmers. We also have young agriculture graduates who are, who are our first becoming farmers, and then they become trainers and researchers. Then we also use ICT in taking this knowledge across. Uh, you can see here uh, videos. We have made more than 800 different videos. These are basically six to eight minute films around different package of practices, inspirational stories. And we also use the smartphones for monitoring the uh, work on ground. And this is again very important because we believe that we have to change the whole village. It's not changing one farmer. So our approach is to take uh, the entire village and we recognize that all farmers will not come in the first year. So we expect it may take about five years, but now we are thinking it may take uh, more than that time. So maybe five to eight years for the whole village to transform. And then a farmer's journey, because a farmer will take only part of her land in the first year. Then if the results are good, expand it, second year, third year. So perhaps they reach their entire area in the third or fourth year, and then they look at higher order interventions. So this is knowledge intensive agriculture. So each year they gain in confidence, they gain in capability. So that gives them greater confidence to bring in more and more land under natural farming. And uh, yeah, I just want to explain how profound uh, Walter's role has been in uh, what we are doing. Uh, you know, it is the insight that he gave about the, you know, reverse of water in the air. And uh, that's what I, you know, I learned through YouTube videos of Walter. And that's how I came in contact with Didi through the YouTube. And it's been such a game changer in our entire uh, program. So what Walter introduced to us was there's a new source of water that is water in the air. And these biological processes are enabling the plants to harness that water in the air and also harness the water in the soil through the biological process. So this is what we call as uh, pre-monsoon dry sowing. And also we have one main season in India during the monsoon that's called the Kharif season or so last from June to September. And then there's one more season after that from October to January uh, or October to February or October to March for some crops. So this is the sowing that is happening in the hot summer before the showers. So this is the pre-monsoon dry sowing. And then, you know, farmers not having irrigation, they're not able to do anything to their land after the first season. So we are now introducing uh, dry sowing after, that means in October, November, to carry them till the next monsoon. So the idea is even in semi-arid areas, rainfall dependent areas, how do you keep the ground covered for 365 days of the year? This is a very major uh, breakthrough. And uh, you can see Walter, I think DD is hidden. Yeah, this is DD. Uh, so this is a field that he saw, which had not uh, received any irrigation, which was totally dependent on uh, rainfall. And uh, because of his visit, we got a lot of insights into the science behind this, gave us greater confidence to take it forward. 
So last year, in spite of the corona, we were able to take it to 100,000 farmers. So these farmers who typically would have a green cover for four to six months are now able to expand it, extend it to seven months, eight months. And some of them have taken it to 12 months. I'll just show you one case study of that. So this year we plan to take it to 300,000 farmers and the work has started because farmers have started sowing it in April itself. And this is one case study of one farmer previously would have kept the ground fallow. It would have been a green cover only for four months of the year. And this is the kind of income you'd have got. Uh, typically this is for a good year. Otherwise you don't exceed 20,000 rupees. Now the same farmer because of the pre-monsoon dry sowing has been able to take a range of crops starting from March onwards. So this becomes one particular season for the farmer, March to June, July to October, and then November to February. So this is what we call 365 days year uh, green cover. So it's good for the soil, good for biodiversity, and more important, good for the livelihoods of the farmer. So this farmer could actually increase the, their incomes uh, two to three times. There are farmers who have increased their income <coughs> four to five times in the first year itself. So this is a very important breakthrough, both from the farmer's livelihoods, but uh, more important from the you know, soil cover and uh, cooling the planet. And that is the basic uh, message of Walter, that uh, the, this uh, cooling process as a, as a pathway to cool the planet by keeping the ground covered with the live green cover. This is one field which was fallow for more than 10 years, was brought to life. And in the very first year, the farmer got uh, incomes throughout the year. So I'm just coming to the uh, conclusion. We are supported by a very good uh, you know, network of uh, research organizations for helping us in uh, exploring the science behind our work. Uh, we also have collaborations with uh, global organizations. We're also supporting some governments, government of Rwanda, government of Kenya, we are in discussions with them, and government of Mexico. Uh, we're also supporting several states uh, within the country. So our expectation is that, you know, we are at a tipping point, around 10 to 12% farmers in our state are now practicing this. So, uh, with this tipping point, I think we'll be able to scale up. The momentum of scaling up uh, increases. So I'll stop sharing. Thank you. Wow. Um, I think I would invite everyone to just have a couple of breaths to let that, to me, it's just so beautiful, um, land in our bodies as well. Hmm. Thank you, Vijay. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I feel it's, it feels really, uh, I feel quite emotional about it. It's just so beautiful. I have been dreaming of something like that for so many years. Uh, so thank you. Thank you for uh, bringing that to us and also for the big part that you've played in that. Um, and so I, I would love to also hear from other people, but I have some, questions that I find quite burning. So if it's okay with everyone, I would love to explore those before and then, or maybe one and then I'll open it up. Um, and it's about the, the way the, the financial resources have, have been used for this. So here, for instance, in England and in the places in Europe that I lived before, um, whenever there is a transition, the subsidies go directly to the farmers as a compensation for the transition. And for some reason, I always found that that is quite counterproductive because if there is some, so if this is my argument and this is not the truth, uh, is how it feels for me is that if you have an incentive that is financial and some other incentive comes that is larger, then it's very easy to move in that direction because 
you're yeah the farmers are not getting that so for me that when you when you named that before i was like wow that that's just so key um so how how does it feel for you and and how did it happen that it it wasn't like the usual thing actually before we started the program in 2015 we had a brainstorming with uh, ngos with uh, government uh, officials scientists and farmers and uh, it was a three days brainstorming on how do we move ahead what all and what the doubts they had and on the last day they all told me that you know of course they mentioned lot of doubts but there was one common doubt saying that if farmers incur losses then uh, how do we support them and they were all in favor of uh, compensation so but uh, somehow i felt that was not a correct decision so i told them that uh, look we will not offer any incentive we will tell the farmers that you test it in a small piece of land if it works you expand it so i said if we are sure about the technology if we know that it's going to work then uh, if it works in one farm it should work in 100 farms 1000 farms 10000 farms so we should not be giving this kind of incentive and uh, so we so we i because i said that if you give an incentive then which farmer will show that their yield has increased because if the yield if they show that the yield has increased then they'll not get the incentive so it can be a perverse incentive uh, but i felt it was more a, a test of our own uh, uh, principles and practices if this work why should we need to compensate anybody but i believe that we should have a different system of compensation because the farmers are doing public good they are regenerating soils you know they are actually giving us good food they are ensuring that water is not polluted so so i believe that the way of supporting farmers the way of compensating farmers is how do we quantify the societal benefits from this kind of agriculture so rather than you know cash incentive for transiting it will be uh, much better to to provide incentives based on uh, the the public good that they are doing so this question is how do you measure it how do you so i i don't have the answers but that is the direction that we are looking at so the future of uh, you know survival of humanity is dependent on how we deal with the planet so therefore it's better to incentivize good behavior or behavior which protects biodiversity protects soil organic matter you know ensures that water is not polluted air is not polluted so so i thought that is the you know a better way of supporting the farmers mm. absolutely that's beautiful um I, yeah it's i i and i'm i'm like wow how how can you how are we going to measure the the service as well but i'm sure i mean that yeah, there there will be a way that 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 part is possibly not so relevant and so and and i also from 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 what you shared i i noticed that there is an investment of the uh financial investment into the infrastructure so I, that the the people who are producing the videos the, the infrastructure yeah. for for the communication so so actually that the the investment is into the education yes uh, our investment you know we estimate that it will cost around 15000 rupees per farmer over a period of 6 to 7 years for this transformation to happen mm. so uh, out of this almost uh, 74% goes into human capacity building Mm. training continuous monitoring another uh, 16% goes into supporting the women self help group networks to adopt this as their agenda motivate them to uh, join in this mm. then around 8% goes in tracking you know project monitoring so the ict infrastructure establishing traceability so so that is so therefore 
almost 90% is in the soft dimension, the human capital and also the social capital. Uh, and basically we're be benefiting from the fact that there's already work done on the organization of the women. Otherwise, even that would have to, in a new place, we'll have to build in these costs that we have to organize the women, organize young farmers, organize farmers. So the cost of this organization has to be built into transformation if it is to be done in a newer uh, location. Mm. And it feels also that 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 cost or cost or investment is is also it's not forever because once the once everything is established then it's it's a system that is keeping itself so it doesn't need uh, the hand holding that that you had in, in yeah, the slide as exactly. well. So our idea is that it takes about seven to eight years. So by the time we build the uh, human capital. We build capacities in each village. We build capacities in each women's self-help group to understand, implement. But of course, there will be some light touch support because there will be a lot of new innovations coming in. So uh, we are finding that you know, with greater knowledge, with greater experience, we are gaining more knowledge that needs to go back to the farmers. So that support will be there. But I think we may just need about Five ten percent of the kind of investment that we are making now. Mm -hmm. By the time, my idea is also to transform the government department so that within the government it gets internalized. So that currently, you know, uh, ninety percent, ninety-five percent is around chemical agriculture. So if the same investment by the universities, by the government, in the agriculture department, horticulture department, animal husbandry. So that's a much bigger challenge. How do you transform their thinking, thinking of the next generation of students? So once that happens, then when this becomes mainstream, Absolutely. so it becomes the responsibility of the state, becomes the responsibility of the society. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Um, the other thing that is really burning for me is the, something you mentioned uh, when we were having a conversation about how the how this has changed the dynamics between men and women in in those societies you mentioned that now women have more they are more hands on in 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 the farm yes yes that's very important because you see earlier when it was a question of buying chemical fertilizers pesticides so it is the men who take the money and go to the marketplace and buy and uh, now they're making the fertilizers themselves. They're making the uh, botanical pesticides themselves. So they don't have to buy anything from outside. And typically the women used to complain because women are financing the agriculture. Yeah. Thanks to being in the women's self-help group. So they used to borrow money for agriculture. So they are saying that now we, we are controlling the, even this expenditure. As it is, the expenditure has gone down. But even that is happening in front of their eyes. So, so there is no, uh, but they're also saying, you know, uh, the, there's, their health has improved tremendously because they are not handling uh, pesticides. So this is the women who have to do the hard work of weeding. They are in the fields, you know, in the mm -hmm. paddy fields. So for a long time, so if that paddy fields are soaked with herbicides, weedicides, so they have a lot of skin problems. Mm -hmm. So apart from the cost saving, it's also their own uh, health benefits which are so important here. Absolutely. Yeah, um, I'm wondering, Deb, you have a question, great. I do, and I have to run at 10.30, so I would just, I love these questions. Um, such a pleasure to be here with you. For the $280 million, right, I think I wrote down that, um, you know, that's quite an investment and you just broke it down into what it goes for. Does the government consider that they've gotten a good return on their investment or how do you kind of show for them what return they have gotten out of it? Okay, so there are multiple benefits, as you have seen from the crop cutting experiments, the net income of farmers has gone up. So easily, 
the the farmers uh, incomes uh, is at least uh, you know net income is increased by as you saw different ratios 20 to 100% but there is a more powerful argument for the government uh, i estimated for me to complete the task of transformation over the next 10 years i will require about 1.35 billion dollars to take all the six now it's about 6.8 million farmers and farm workers but over the same 10 years of time this farming is eliminating the use of chemical fertilizers so currently the government is subsidizing fertilizers so i calculated the savings in fertilizer subsidy so it amounts to around 3.6 billion dollars in the same 10 year period then we looked at this form of agriculture requires less water and then less electricity and we are seeing savings of water anywhere between 30 to 50% and a fifth year farmer is actually saving 50% in water the first year farmer is saving 30% and the government uh, the state government in this case <clears throat> will be spending about 1.2 billion dollars this year alone on electricity subsidy so i calculated what is the savings to the government in the form of electricity subsidies so that is coming to you know for 1.35 billion dollar investment in the transformation the state government will save around 2.70 billion in electricity subsidy and uh, we have the government of india i mean the central government saving 5.40 billion dollars in fertilizer subsidy so it's not a bad investment with 1 dollar spent uh, the government is saving about 4 to 5 dollars apart from the benefits to the farmers apart from uh, health ex health benefits apart from all other benefits we are, we are not able to quantify but this is the argument with my finance department that look i am saving money for you so we are now conducting a very large scale study to establish these savings in a very granular manner and to to make this as a a most uh, beneficial investment by the government wow thank you dev that's an amazing question yeah, it's very relevant for me. Um, uh -huh. I'm tomorrow. I'll have hopefully the final round of interview to be the um, assistant for climate to the U.S. Navy, to the Department of the Navy, and I care very much about land regeneration and like this. All this, you know. So I know Didi. I know Judy oh, okay. Schwartz. I don't know Walter Yanello. I've heard of him. So I'm trying to not quantify yet for them, but like put in their terms, like why <laughs> this sort of thing matters to them. And I think of, you know, the, the Navy and the U.S. Armed Forces think through the lens of resilience. Yes. So their bases are underwater and all this. And then I think overseas, I think, you know, the United States has been a partner to so many nations and we have such alliances that, uh, anyway, We'll talk about the state of those alliances right now, <laughs> but but I was thinking, you know, what better way to sort of reclaim our our, our tarnished reputation at this moment um, than to engage like this transforms nations. Yeah. This transforms, you know, as Department of Defense, we worry about mass migration scenarios Absolutely. around the world and and but destabilizing. And you know, when when people have money, when people can feed themselves, when they have water, you don't have the Taliban coming in. You don't Absolutely. have Al Qaeda yes. coming in. You don't have, you know, name your hotspot. So that's what's on my list. So thank you so much um no, no, i, and I would look forward to being in conversation with you more so. very very important from national security because you see that photograph i showed you where they get only one crop in a year mm -hmm. so what do they yeah. do for eight months of the year 
so the men have to migrate so they mm. go to the urban areas and now because of covid all those men have returned back to their villages there is no employment got it thank you so for the same family we are now saying that you don't have to leave the village you can get better incomes than you get from the city and then you have a healthy life but for me the bottom line is all this is important for our future generation i mean yes definitely you know the the economic uh, current economic benefits are important but what use is it you know if you have uh, killed the future so so for me the green cover is so vital to the cooling of the planet that it's not yeah. just the incomes but then the the entire uh, you know the water cycle which has gone out of uh, gear yeah. that's why you're having so many cyclones so many hurricanes and also droughts so so we believe that uh, if we can cool the planet through green cover that's a safe way of protecting our future awesome so it has it's beneficial in so many dimensions I know, I know, but this is wonderful. Thank you for adding that piece about the men. What do they do in those eight months? Because I, I'm, I'm giving a keynote speech on Tuesday to um, there'll be a few hundred planners for all federal, you know, U.S. government federal planners of bases right. and land, and so I'm giving a keynote speech and I'm going to highlight this project. Giddy had already told me about it, so I've got your slides. I've got stuff that I'm going to talk about. But the eight months from a national security piece, where do those men go? Well, they Absolutely. go to cities and we yeah. know what happens in cities mm. and like nothing good. And uh, so I oh, will yeah. highlight that piece and I have a 1030. So I really apologize that I have to, I'm just going to go on mute because it just take a few minutes. I might be back, but I will, uh, I can't be late. Thank you. Thank you so <laughs> much for being here. Deb. Wow. Uh, yeah. Um, Talia, you have a question in the chat. Do you want me to read it? Uh, are are you able to quantify the health benefits in any way? Because I can uh, imagine that that's quite a cost for for most uh, governments. Yeah. So what we are doing is uh, we have a very reputed organization, and you know, Mr. Pawan Sukhdev, he is also the winner of the Tyler Award for uh, you know environment. So this is called the the Team Agri Framework, where they where they work on quantifying different benefits. So we are in the process of quantifying the health benefits. It will take some time, but yes, we are undertaking that work. But the, the feedback is so, you know, uh, so overwhelming. So even without any quantification, I know that every woman farmer I have met, so the first thing she says is the health benefit. Now the men may talk about money that they have gain money but as for a woman is concerned she first talks about her health health of her children so the skin rashes the you know rheumatism or gastric problem the hair so all of them have told me that their health has uh, you know benefited but yes we are also in the process of quantifying Thank you. Didi, you look like you had a question or a comment. Oh, well, I, I, a question and a comment. Um, I'm, I'm really excited about um, Deb Loomis. Deb and I have been having conversations about this as, as a global security issue, you know, um, not just for the US, but for every country. And um, I, I, uh, I think that's I think that's a really key piece of this, and that 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 when we start looking at resilience and security, it really is about uh, about reducing flood risk, reducing drought risk, reducing crop failure, you know, improving health, improving life satisfaction, which I think is a huge thing we haven't really talked about, but the you know sense of meaning and purpose and um, doing good in the world that comes with this kind of thing. For those who are practicing it, seeing green returning to the landscape, seeing health returning to the community, seeing the water clean up. So, so I think I think those are all aspects here. Uh, I I was curious, and I know I've asked you this before, but I wonder if there's any more more data. Um, 
I, I imagine you would have said it if there was, but but with the COVID rise in India, which we are all reading about and praying for you all, is there any sense that um, that the communities that have converted to natural farming are having better, either either fewer deaths or fewer cases or fewer side effects or? It's only perception, uh, Didi, in the sense that uh, uh, all those who have taken up this, uh, you know, the kitchen garden, so that they're having vegetables, wide range of vegetables. So I met some of them in the last few months. Of course, I have stopped moving last yeah. 15 days. Yeah. Uh, but uh, prior to that, they all told me that uh, during the COVID days, they could not move out, they could not get any vegetables. But because of the uh, you know, ZBNF uh, kitchen gardens, they, their health has improved. They definitely yeah. that they, but I have not done this exercise of uh, uh, the, the correlation or correlation. Right. We have not done that, but it's only a, uh, a intuitive kind of a thing. So right currently we have not done that, but it is, yeah. but they tell me what very interesting finding we got. I, I'm, I'm investigating that, but because of COVID, you know, some of my, we worked, we looked at the, you know, about 93 villages in the tribal areas of Vijayanagaram district. Uh, they have now become bio villages. It's more than one year. So all these villages, all farmers, entire uh, cultivable area is zero chemical. And in that villages, we looked at the disease profile and incidence of malaria has dropped drastically. Mm -hmm. Now the results are so astounding. I'm not sharing it with anybody because till I, <laughs> till I do some more probing. So I asked the district collector to give me the comparative figures of malaria uh, in, in other bundles where ZBNF uh, is not universal. So, so this is a very interesting uh, then uh, diabetes. So all those figures, we see a very dramatic uh, change in the health profile. So we, we plan to probe this because I, this is a very important uh, uh, requirement. And of course, the usual, as you know, they say it tastes better, the shelf life is better. So I believe all this is because of some you know, good trace minerals getting into those vegetables and uh, grains. So, yeah, to answer your question, we need to, we don't have the data on the COVID and this. So I, I don't know how to, because given the atmosphere now, I don't want to put it as a research question. Right? Right. Also, it, it look uh, very, you know, uh, gaulish. Yeah, but it does make sense and on numerous levels to me, because it, first of all, if people are eating more vegetables and more nutrient dense food, the comorbidity factors should, yes. should go down. But secondly, we have improved air quality, which seems to be an issue with COVID, uh, you know, that it's coexistent. Um, so, so yeah, it, it, and, then, and then of course, just the, the pesticide themselves, that if your system Absolutely. is already struggling against uh, toxins, that your immune system is going to be compromised in that way. So, yeah, I'm very, very interested to see what comes of that. So, I, yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, yeah. Didi, for that question as well. Um, yeah, and I'm, 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 I'm flabbergasted about, I'm really fascinated about the, the malaria dropping. Uh, it, that, yeah, cool. <laughs> I need to look at that. That seems yeah. like it could also be related to less standing water on the field, right? Because as mm -hmm. the soil develops a sponge, there's less puddling. And so much Absolutely. less breeding ground for, for mosquitoes. Yes, Didi, because you see, I have worked in the tribal areas and right from 85 onwards, my first posting was in the tribal areas. And in the tribal areas, we also have the falciparum. That is a more deadly mosquito. And I realize how important the reduction in malaria in the tribal areas is. This is uh, really astounding. I'm thinking it's because of, yes, you, you're right, less uh, standing water in the fields. I'm also thinking that because of the increased biodiversity, maybe mm -hmm. they're also eating the, the, you know, there are some predators which have yes. developed there. So 
but the results are so astounding i am little scared of sharing them but i'll i'll just give you one minute i'll trying to uh, just give me one second Yeah, we had malaria cases from 1150 in 2016-17. They have dropped to 96 in 2020-21. It's so say the, say the number again. From I, I, I'll just I'll just show you that slide because okay. the results are so good. I I'm you know I'm scared of sharing that because they'll pounce on me. Is there a randomized control? This control, that control? Oh no. Okay, I'll tell you no, the number. No, it's again. Okay. Yeah, it's a problem. All right, I don't know why. Yeah. uh did 1150 cases in 2016-17 yeah and in 2020-21 there were 96 cases wow yeah then typhoid from 360 it went down to 6 uh anemia anemia from 260 it has come down to 12 skin diseases from 256 it has come down to 52 yeah so the results are so incredible that i just you know i'm holding it back till i have you know some other you know control mandal see what is the i don't see any any way it could have gone down so dramatically there is no no way that uh, could have gone down but still i just the two good to believe so i i want to be careful before that's very I interesting how many that. how many villages was that 93 villages 90 wow yeah so it's not a small number no yeah. and um, i yeah. i can say from experience that the coffee from those areas <laughs> yes it's very very delicious <laughs> it made me feel different than any other coffee i've ever had <laughs> <laughs> Tanya had a question. I think that's a that's a great question. Do you want me to read it, Tanya? I will read it. And just come in if you want. Um I oh, know there you are. Go ahead. Yeah, hi. Yeah. Um, thank you, Vijay. Thank you, Vita. This is a flower gathering. It's encouraging and beautiful both to hear and read. Uh, and i was wondering vj if um in any of the areas that you work in do you confront violence in any form uh are any of your farmers or you yourself uh subject to state violence or uh, is people being are people being uh i don't know chased by organized crime do you have to deal also with uh large or vast um projects like mining or you know, dams or um mm-hmm. como dices deforestación deforestation oh. are, are okay. you are you do you confront any of these issues and if not okay. mm-hmm. uh yeah one i mean uh, the i mean as of now we don't see any of these issues really troubling the natural farming program but there could be some local disputes in some places you know it's not a state violence but there could be you know disputes which are not related to our program there are uh, issues but the issues that you mentioned about mining then uh, displacement uh, in recent years we have not uh, seen any large scale displacement in our state Uh, there could be some uh, you know displacement on account of road widening let us say uh, but the all state governments all governments now in india have a very generous compensation packages and land acquisition is not a easy process uh, but it's not related to our program it is uh, you know 
uh, but we don't have any state violence or state uh, you know violence from the state or organized crime by virtue of this program if you are that's what you mean is your meaning is this provoking that kind of violence is that your meaning it's whether it's causing or not causing it but having it as a side effect or just being embedded in one of these contexts because a lot of what happens in mexico i come from mexico uh, oh okay and a lot of the projects like the one you're describing uh, are normally interrupted via state violence, prosecutor prosecution of the uh, oh, ecological no, groups, or no, no. no looting of the lands or burning of the lands. I mean, there there is a lot of okay. a context of violence in general. Oh, uh, okay. No, no, no such case here, uh, because a it is uh, it's a government program. It's a government program. And uh, again, it's a program which is not causing any harm to anybody. So I don't see the context of this uh, violence. And I'm also happy to inform you that uh, Mexico government itself is changing its policies. So we will be signing an MOU with the Mexican government for uh, you know, technical support and technical exchanges around uh, agroecology. Mm, I'm, I'm wondering if uh, part of Tanya's question, and, and please correct me if I'm wrong, Tanya, is also that um, if, if, if like in some parts of Mexico and, and in Venezuela, for instance, where I grew up, the, the, the violence is so embedded in the culture already that sometimes uh, projects like this have, um, it, it might be more difficult to establish just because there is the, the Kind of, I don't know if it's fear against change or, or if it's um, just organized crime that takes over uh, the projects. So that it's good to know that that's not the case in Andhra Pradesh. But I can imagine that in other places that could be something that needs to be um, incorporated. There are yeah. some cases coming out of jealousy. Ah, wow. <laughs> so Between are... the farmers. Yes, yes, yes. So ah. Among relatives, basically, because we have a case, uh, a case of a widow who decided to transform her plot of land and her husband's uh, brother and that family burnt her crop. So, what? <laughs> because she proved them wrong. She got mm -hmm. more money than these people did. Mm. So there are some isolated cases like that. But she became more resilient because of that. And then now she told me this is after the, in the third year. So the same set of people have come to her for learning. Ah, that's beautiful. Yeah, that's right. So there are some <laughs> isolated cases. There are also cases where, you know, in one case, the father actually told the son to get out of the house, saying that I don't believe in this kind of agriculture. You're mm. not food security. Uh, and he prevented, uh, you know, his daughter-in-law from working with her, uh, with her husband. So he told him that you do the work yourself, mm. and will nobody from the house will support you. So there are these kind of small things, mm. but they also increase the resolve of the people who are transforming to make the transformation. But there is no no organized crime or uh, no such thing. It's uh, supported mm. by the government. Mm. And we had actually a very bad incident uh, about uh, four months ago in a major town uh, on account of this herbicides used in the fields. So the vegetables were actually, you know, carrying some of these residues and more than 600 people got hospitalized, one person died. And that actually, you know, made the chief minister announce that, you know, the entire state will go organic. So, so this, uh, you know, the, the bigger, crime, bigger crime, I would say, bigger harm being caused by chemical agriculture. Uh, so, no, uh, thank you, Tanya. No such cases in our case. Thank you. Thank you, Vijay. I'm wondering if, so there's, we have another, about another 13 minutes or so. So I'm wondering if, people have other questions that they want to ask or comment? Can you play that video I've sent yeah. you? Can you do that from your system? So that is something very remarkable, which also helps 
you know, address uh, uh, question by Dave on what to do with the eight months. In fact, Dave, what we are doing is so important for Africa so to sort of uh, one photograph I showed you was a land where no cultivation had happened for 10 years. But through these methods, we could bring that land under cultivation and the farmer could get income in the first year itself. So, so this is uh, very important um, uh, from the whole world. Oh, the whole world. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Please go, Please ahead. go ahead. All right. This is her land. She's preparing the land. This is in July. As you can see, there's no rainfall there. It is dry. So this is the bio inoculum. Uh, typically, it's prepared and spread before the seed. Now the seeds are being sown. You can see the you know, crop diversity, about 10 to 15 different vegetable crops, pulses, this is the mulch material. And this is very important to prevent losses of uh, water and to keep the surface cool. So she has spread that mulch, the groundnut shells on the beds, uh, on the raised, raised beds, and then the sesbania sticks will be put in the furrows. It can be any other, yeah, you can see here. So this is after the seeds have been sown. And the germination, there was some light rainfall. So there was germination in five days. This is the liquid inoculum she is mixing. So which typically she'll apply every 10 to 15 days, uh, both on the, uh, the foliar spray and also on the soil. You can see the growth of the crop. It's a very rocky soil and a very infertile, so-called infertile soil. And this is the rainfall figures. So you can see rainfall only for about five, five months, which is unusual. It's actually very heavy rainfall this year. Otherwise, rest of the time, there's no rainfall, almost zero rainfall. 91% rainfall comes in this five months, but typically it would be only in four months. These are vegetables that she has harvested. This is in uh, hot summer, I mean, uh, February. Gets quite hot after January in, in Anantapur. Yeah, you can see them very healthy, nutritious. This is another crop, pigeon pea. Then we took a video from, uh, this, are the, this is the agrobiodiversity of crops, which she has had throughout the year. And there's still crops there in her field, even now. This is her income. As you can see, she's getting income throughout the year, every month. Otherwise, there would be, you know, only one spike, maybe around October, November, rest of the time, no income. Now she says, sir, every time I go to the field, I'm getting some income. So this is a footage we captured on 13th March, shows how uh, this 365 days green cover is possible, even in very arid areas. So you can see it's only her field which is green and there's no other field with crop. And I checked up last week also in April. Again, she was telling me that she's harvesting more brinjals, the eggplants and uh, you know, castor crop, pigeon pea. So this is shot through a drone. and completely barren fields.
and her field is so green and so cool. You can see wide diversity of crops. This is cabbage, huge cabbages. Then castor, red gram. This is the yellow. This is the red gram. This is castor. So the the temperature in her field is uh, you know much much cooler than the obviously the barren soils. And what is interesting is many of these crops, you know, red gram, red gram and castor, uh, typically they are harvested in December, January. But because of the abundant food supply in the soil, she is she she has seen that these crops have regenerated. So she has taken the fifth crop from castor. In earlier years, she would have got lucky to get even one crop, and she's saying, "Sir, I'm getting income every 30, 40 days from castor crop." And same thing is happening with, you just see this, this is something, you know, she herself can't imagine, she and her husband can't imagine that uh, this kind of greenery is possible. And they get incomes every month from this. And she's the leader of the self-help group. So it's also her mandate to motivate other members. So in that village now, this year, another 10 farmers will, will do what we call as 365 days uh, green cover. Yeah. Thank you, Dita. You, you can close this. Wow, so beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> this is really, you know, beyond our expectations. I, I never imagined that uh, such a thing can happen. Uh, Didi, you have not seen this. You are muted. I said I, I have seen it and I love that video. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. She's a remarkable I'm, lady. She is the leader of her self help group. Yeah. Judy, please go ahead. Oh, I was sorry. I was just sharing. Deb had asked me um, for a for a link about the how much cooler uh, transpiring surface is a green surface is than than pavement or bare soil. And um, this was a study from Turkey that showed that um, the difference uh, between um, Asphalt and, and sorry, uh, let's see, here we go. Um, well, I'm gonna, yeah, I'll, I'll, put, I'll put this in the chat because it's pretty, pretty impressive differences in terms of um, the temperature difference between bare soil, grass and concrete. So um, and I'm having trouble, there's so many numbers here that I'm, I don't want to say them and then say the wrong one, but I'll put it in the chat here. Um, I think it's, I think it's, uh, yes, okay, between, as, AC means asphalt concrete. So between the difference between asphalt concrete and grass is 11.79 degrees Celsius, which uh, I don't know if someone can trans, translate that to Fahrenheit, but that's really, Wow. You know, because I was noticing in that video, there's a road going by, um, and just bare soil and grass is 5.3 oh. degrees Celsius. Uh, so. Oh, I'll then, measure the temperature. Did I'll do that? I forgot. I'll I'll measure yeah. the temperature, asphalt, the barren soil, and this green plot. Yes, and then you notice here that the second that. the second set of numbers is talking about two meters above. And I always oh. tell the story of you, of you and I standing in the uh, standing <laughs> out in the field on that hot day where it was cooler to be in the sun but in the vegetation than it was to be under the tent where there was bare soil around us. So, <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, for me that's the, it's. Uh, I grew up in a city and I lived for most of my life in a city, and it was always amazing how the, the difference you can feel it in in a summer day just passing, even, not even on, but passing alongside a, a little garden, it would make such a big difference, really like at least two degrees, sometimes five degrees, just but that little cover of vegetation is just 
I find it amazing that we are not doing that everywhere. We are now looking at a technology to measure this uh, temperature differential based on uh, satellite imagery. So I'm looking at that. So if that, uh, because I think uh, Walter believes that, you know, climate change, we should not be looking only at CO2 levels, but essentially looking at the heat. So is, if there is a way in which we can demonstrate that uh, this is, this is you know, has a better cooling impact, then we change the entire discourse on climate change. In fact, Deb, that is something that we are, uh, you know, looking at very seriously. Because if we do this, you know, so I mean, the entire obsession on just bringing down CO2 levels uh, and then thinking that we have failed. But if, we, if there's a different way in which we can cool the planet and which is improving livelihoods, improving health, you know, I can't see any loss here. It's a win, 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 win in so many dimensions. So to that, the, the biggest driver, the biggest thing which keeps me, uh, you know, engaged so much in this program is that if this is a pathway for the whole world to come out of climate change, then whatever effort I'm putting in here is worthwhile. Of course, there are other benefits, but to me, this is the biggest one because our entire generation, you know, what happens to my child, my grandchildren? So we have compromised their future. And that is the promise of this. That's the biggest promise of what we're doing. And I think it just percolates through everything in life. It's not all of it. It's not just about climate. It's yeah, like you were saying, it's about the the health of the planet, and and that includes the health of human beings and our society and everything. Um, I'm really curious. I, I know I'm, I'm, we are we are um, at the end of our hour. I have some time to stay on, but I I, I honor if anybody needs to leave. I don't know about you, VJ. If you have a couple yeah. of minutes to answer. Yeah, yeah, Talia has some questions. Yeah, so that would be great. Yeah, uh, I think Talia, the, the, in this case, she started with a bare land. Uh, but yes, what you're saying is true. Most of the lands are barren because that is a semi-arid area. So the only when it rains, you know, between June, June to September or sometimes June to October, that's the only time the land is green. The rest of the time, you saw the neighboring plots, they're all barren. So now this lady, she will, she will not plow the land again. She doesn't need to. So wherever there are gaps, she will actually punch a hole and uh, push the seeds in. So she's already planning what she will do in, uh, she told me that she had sown some seeds in March itself. And thanks to the unseasonal rains, they have germinated. So, so the effort by the farmer has also reduced. There is no weeding to be done. There is no pest management. There is no plowing expenditure. So the only expenditure is harvesting. So that's a happy expenditure. So that's why she says, sir, every time I go to the, to the field, I get uh, uh, some income. So it's, you know, uh, it's a pleasure going to the field. So that other farmers can't say that. Because yes, your uh, I mean the the fields are barren there. There is nothing uh, growing, and so it's not only loss of livelihood. They are also losing that soil. They are also losing the uh, you know the the benefits of uh, whatever uh, top soil, the soil organic matter. They are losing it every year. They can't afford to lose that. And what inspires is that farmers are now inspired to take the lands which are fallow for more than eight, 10 years, and then bring them into cultivation. So, yeah, it's the farmers who inspire us. And the land, I'm sure. Uh, we are so happy to see this, and we are getting also very good results in the tribal areas, which are again, you know, very vulnerable communities. So, so they are so happy that they are getting incomes throughout the year. And uh, yeah, still long way to go, another 
you know, we need to, you know, because we are at a tipping point, about 10, 12% farmers are already part of this process. So, so we are hopeful that, you know, we'll be successful in our work. Mm. Was she, was, uh, I also like uh, the other question from Talia, if, did she go all in for the first time or did she, you said that often the farmers start with a little part and then they expand? Yeah, in this case, uh, you know, they have other plots of land also. They, they initiated in a small way, but this was at the you know, motivation of my district project manager. So this entire piece of land she has gone, yeah, uh, first time, yes. There are some farmers like that, you know, the farmer I met, he had four acres of land. So he, he said that all four acres, he, you know, uh, took up natural farming in the first year itself. So I asked him, why did he do that? Why didn't he try in uh, half an acre? He said, sir, if it works in half acre, it has to work in four acres. So why should I waste my time? So, <laughs> so, uh, but, and he was, he, he read a lot. He, he imbibed a lot of knowledge. So it's knowledge intensive agriculture. Yeah. So if somebody goes deep, it's also very simple, but then we have complicated our lives such that we don't believe in simple things. Yeah. And, so, and I, I, one thing that comes to mind when, when, I mean, people always say, oh, you know, like knowledge intensive agriculture in this case, it feels like a problem, but I think Knowledge, knowledge intensive also means a closer connection to the land and that in itself has so many benefits for the farmer at least that's how that's how it feels to me when I'm farming naturally then I get I get I don't know I sometimes I have a feeling I don't need to eat because I get kind of the energy from from the nature around yeah no, there are two, two more things here one is the farmer learns from the land the second thing is because of the self-help groups. There's a lot of sharing, sharing of knowledge, learning from each other. Because typically in a village, you know, if some farmer does it differently, others will laugh at her or at him. So they don't, they don't do it. Whereas since this has been, this has come through the women's collective, so they support each other. And that's the reason worldwide, out of 600 million farmers, only 0.5% are certified organic farmers after some 30 years of the organic farming movement. Maybe there are some uncertified farmers, maybe 10 times that number. I don't think so. But even if you assume that 10 times that number are uncertified, still less than 5% over 30 years of work. But in Andhra Pradesh, in just the fifth year, we have reached 10% farmers. And once I tie up the resources, I think by 2027 or so, I should reach more than 80% of the farmers. Because for me, 10, 15% is a tipping point. Then the rest of the things happen. And this because I already organized, over 10 years I had organized 11.5 million women. So the most difficult part was the first five years. And then after that, it moved on its own. So, so therefore, the... The, the reason for this success is, uh, of course, also we have our traditions where, you know, the, the cow dung, cow urine played a very important part in agriculture. So they also link it with that. They, even now they call the fertilizers as English medicine, English fertilizers or government fertilizer. They don't see it as their own fertilizers. Even now if I ask them, so they'll say this is English. English medicine or English fertilizer. But they regard the cow dung and cow urine as their own. So that connect is there. But secondly, the fact that the women's collective nurtures this kind of, uh, you know, people taking up a different kind of agriculture, that is the one of the biggest reasons why we have been able to take it to scale so quickly. So it's not just the technology. It is the social capital, the human capital, and also the way you, you should have a long-term view. It's not that one year things will be done. So you have to also prepare for failures, etc. cetera. So, so it's a combination of multiple innovations. That's what I tried to put in the slide as to what are those five, six 
innovations which came together in Andhra Pradesh to make it happen. Of course, not that everything is perfect. We we you know we also made many mistakes. We we learned from mistakes, and we also benefited from new knowledge. I think that is something I'm very, you know, that's why I'm so grateful to Walter. The kind of insights he gave me, you know, he opened my mind, saying that you know there's water in the air. So why are you worried about groundwater and other kinds of water? You get fresh, fresh, pure <laughs> water from the air. And in the tropics, it's about 50,000 parts per million, up to 50,000 parts per million. So, so that was the, you know, one of those aha moments so where we, we got a solution. Wow. Nice. I'm, I'm, uh, thank you. Um, I'm afraid I need to go to another session in about like four minutes. I see there are some really good questions in the chat. I am yeah, wondering yeah. if I can join the other session through my phone and leave this open if people want to stay longer. I'm perfectly fine with that. Um, I think we'll also conclude, I have to, but I'll just quickly answer in the next two, three minutes. Great. So yes, handholding uh, is required for everybody. And there's a very automatic way of providing handholding. It doesn't you know, require a great effort. The women's self-help group itself through their regular meetings, they have a regular meeting once in 15 days, once a month. So in their meetings, they discuss these matters. And we have the 6,000 community resource persons who are champion farmers. So it is their duty to go to each of these new farmers, see how their fields are doing, provide knowledge to them. Then, uh, yeah, are these lands historically or were they, yeah, I think the 100 years ago, they were very good lands. So through deforestation, through you know the changes in the climate, they have become like this. Uh, the certification, we are not encouraging certification for local markets. So it's basically based on trust. They're able to market their produce. But if it has to go a longer way, like we are looking at coffee, for instance, if it has to be exported or turmeric. So then we look at uh, certification. But I believe this certification itself is a very complex process. And uh, you know it's a big hurdle to greater coverage of farmers into natural farming. Yeah, I think, I hope they, they, my responses are making sense to Tanya. Okay. Great. Wow, thank you so much. You're amazing in, in, in your time uh, management as well. <laughs> I'm sure you have a lot of experience with that. Um, yeah, I, I, again, I just want to ask everyone for being here. This feels, I, I feel really blessed by, by this. Um, and thank you, Vijay, very much for all you do and, and for being here today as well. No, no, thank you very much, Jita. And so nice to see Didi and also meet new friends. And uh, I hope all of us can stay together and, you know, take it forward elsewhere. And I look forward to any, any queries, anything that you'd like to know more from us. So very happy to part of this. Thank you so much, Jita. Thank and you. Bye. Thank you all. Namaste. Yeah. Namaste. 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 <laughs> Namaste. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you.